Okay, so um, good afternoon, and um, I want to just begin um, by welcoming you all to our first Genet Global Lecture for the 2015-2016 academic term. Um, it's customary to begin this first session at least with a quick introduction to or a quick reminder um, about um, the nature of this programme. So the Pierre Genet Memorial Programme was created in Osgood um, in 1989. And each year it brings uh, internationally recognised scholars to the law school and they present um, their work, they share their knowledge, they engage with classes, they meet with our graduate students and discuss many sort of pressing issues in contemporary law and policy. The programme itself is made possible by the Pierre Genet Memorial Fund, which was established to honour the memory of P Pierre Genet, who was a graduate of Osgoode Hall Law School, a treasurer of the Law Society of Upper Canada, and one of the finest councils in Canada. So today we're very lucky um, to be welcoming um, our guest, Professor Mitu Gulati, who is a professor of law at Duke University School of Law. Um, he was previously um, based on the faculties of UCLA and Georgetown Law. His primary area of research is the study of government debt contracts, um, and he focuses in particular on questions about how sovereign debt contract provisions have evolved and how they might better be structured. Um, Professor Gulati has authored articles in the Journal of Legal Studies, the Review of Finance and Law and Social Inquiry, amongst others. Not one to blow his own horn, um, his faculty bio lists as one of his greatest accomplishments a second place finish in the fancy dress competition in third grade. We don't have photos to prove it, but we'll take him on his word. Um, so his talk today forms part of a larger book project with Joseph Blocher on the question of rethinking legal fictions of sovereignty and sovereign immunity in the modern era, an era which um, recognises that perhaps that the rights of monarchs um, might be less important than the rights of people to be free from oppression. So other parts of this book project include um, analyses of tradable refugee rights and the price of regional expulsion. Today his talk is on a market for sovereign control um, and without further delay please join me in welcoming our Genet Global faculty member Professor Mitu Gulati. Thank you guys. Um, a little video. All right. Uh, so thanks, thanks for coming. It, I, I realize this is inappropriate for me to ask, but is there, is there any way those of you who are sitting there in that like tiny little corner, and you, John, I know you, would could move a little bit because I like to, I like to look at you when I talk to see your reaction, and you're just gonna um, make it very very difficult. So sorry. I hope this doesn't make you get up and leave. Um, <laughs> But uh, but I because this is this like I'm looking at the you know it's kind of depressing. Uh, but you're I know you're there. Uh, all right. So some background. Um, thank you for having me. I don't normally get to give fancy lectures like this, uh, so I'm very grateful that you had me here. So let me give you some background on what I do and why this is unusual for me. Uh, for those of you who are faculty in law schools, uh, this is familiar, but for those of you who are students, let me explain. Most people who teach at fancy law schools like this, uh, you do your research on big questions. That's what it means to teach at a fancy law school. Your big questions like, you know, how do I solve uh, you know, the global health crisis? And how do I solve poverty? Things like that. Uh, that is not what I do. I am the exact opposite. I work on the tiniest of questions. My specialty is reading the fine print in boilerplate contracts. Yeah, what nobody else does. And I realized that I was good at this in law school when I couldn't pay my rent. And I decided, all right, I can't pay my rent, but I am paying tuition to this very expensive law school. Let me see if I can read my contract and figure out whether or not, you know, having a few cockroaches in my apartment means I don't have to pay my rent. 
turned out I didn't have to pay my rent for a really long time. Uh, and I thought, okay, this is, this is it, this is me. Um, now, in terms of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, in terms of my research primarily, I help people not pay their rent. <laughs> but mostly I help governments. When governments, which happens very often, cannot pay their debts, sometimes if there's absolutely no one else they can call, they come to me and they say, you know, we can't pay, can you help us out? Can you read the fine print? And so this is how I got to the question that is the topic of uh, my talk, which is the question that was in front of Ukraine about a year and a half to two years ago. And Ukraine, uh, tell me, I have students um, who have raised their hand, uh, and this is of course in the US, I think this wouldn't happen here, uh, and said, you know, where is Ukraine? Um, isn't it a part of Russia? So I had to explain to them that that is no longer the case, in fact, that, that, that's somewhat at the heart of the dispute. Uh, but Ukraine, about a year and a half ago, is in a conflict with Russia, and goes from being this country that has actually great financials. It has a debt to GDP ratio that's in the range of 20 to 40%, which, which for a Western economy is spectacularly good. You know, Japan is at over 200%. Actually, Canada is pretty good compared to most Western uh, economies. But Ukraine was good. People were willing to lend to it. But it gets into the conflict with Russia over Crimea and now over its eastern regions. And it goes from a very good set of financials to a terrible set of financials where it just basically cannot pay bills. Not able to collect taxes, cannot pay bills. And so at the heart of what I'm going to talk about, both in terms of the little picture and the big picture, and I, I had to bring in a fancy co-author who does you know, big theory, uh, Joseph Bloker, my dear friend down the hall. Um, is the question of what to do about Ukraine's debt. And I was looking at the, you know, so I get nervous to come to talk to all of you about this question. And it's been in the news, so I checked the news sources this morning. And it turns out there was a debate in the Ukrainian parliament, uh, as you can see, um, about the question of whether to pay the Russians. And I thought, as, as a start, um, we should watch the video of the debate. It's about a minute and a half. Okay, this is my favorite bit. And this is my absolute favorite bit. This is one of the few sensible people there. And she's just so horrified. Um, okay. Um, I, I was supposed to go and address them a few, few months ago. Uh, all right. Um, so at the heart of this project, what we started with, and I will spend uh, the bunch of the time here sort of explicating the problem that was facing us in thinking about how to help Ukraine with its debt to Russia. And then that should give you a window into the bigger project. But, um, I will try not to talk as much as I would like to so we can get to questions. Because this stuff, it is literally, it's going on this week. The decisions are being made. This is a parliamentary debate about whether to pay Russia or not. If you want, I mean, the Ukrainian parliament, the Rada, is somewhat famous for engaging in fisticuffs. Uh, so 
the, the other, if you like videos like this, you like parliamentarians punching each other, the other uh, video is about whether to renew the lease uh, on the, the port in uh, Sevastopol that the Russians took over. So then in the end, there was no question of renewing the lease. This gives you, this should give you a sense of how precipitous the change was. So you see January of 13, these are the bond prices for Ukraine, uh, their, their government uh, debt bond prices. Ukraine is actually doing pretty damn well. And I, my previous gig in terms of what I had spent the, the two years prior to this was working on Greece. And this is quite, these are really good numbers especially for this period of time. And you see there's a drop by 50% during the conflict. So you, you literally, you go from a country that is trying to join the European Union, it's, it's thriving in terms of its resources and what is going to just utter um, chaos. Right. Now, if you care about the numbers in terms of the finances and you're worried about foreign debt, for a small country. What you care about are your foreign reserves. And you care about the foreign reserves because that's the money you have in euros or US dollars or, or Swiss francs. That's the money you have to pay your foreign creditors who want their money in the foreign currency. Because your currency, the Ukrainian currency at this point, has dropped in value to 40% of what it was in January 2013. So you, you desperately need foreign currency reserves. And these are the foreign currency reserves of Ukraine. And actually, this I couldn't get the latest graph um, from the numbers from the last few days. The, these are, this, the foreign reserves have dropped even more because as you probably know, the con actually, the, I think the news uh, sources have stopped reporting on Ukraine now that all they talk about is the refugee crisis in um, Europe. Uh, but the foreign reserves have gone down even further than this, but under five billion. Under five billion in foreign reserves is really important since Ukraine's debt, what it owes in 2015, is closer to 15 billion. Right? So it has a 10 billion shortfall, 10 billion US dollar shortfall in terms of what it has to pay this year. And there's not that much remaining. So if it doesn't pay, it goes into default and sort of cardiac arrest. Now, crucial for us is that this is the amount of money that is coming due this year, in the next few months. So we're close to the end of the year. Is that there is a $3 billion debt, a $3 billion direct debt to the Russians. This was a debt that the Russians had gotten on their books because the prior government, prior to 2013, the prior government was, let's say, in bed with Mr. Putin, right? Mr. Yanukovych. And in order to prop up Mr. Yanukovych and to stop him from, or stop the Ukrainian legislature from closer ties to the European Union, Russia promised them a loan of 15 billion. Of the 15 billion, they got 3 billion before things fell apart and you had the mini revolution. That 3 billion is due this year, December. Right. Now, Ukraine also has a bunch of private creditors, mutual funds, banks, in, a lot of them in the US and Canada. And Ukraine has support from the Western governments. After all, it is fighting the evil Mr. Putin. But a lot of the Western governments are not doing so well, so the IMF has promised Ukraine 17.5 billion a significant amount which is already there, but it's conditioned. IMF money always comes with conditions. And the IMF has said, we're going to give you this money, but on the condition that you do not take our money and use it to pay creditors, 
private creditors, mutual funds, hedge funds in the US and Canada, some in Europe as well, but mostly in this part of the world. We want you to use that money to develop your economy. And we want you simultaneously to demand relief from those private funds. Now, that, that negotiation process took many, many months. The private funds finally came to agreement about a week ago to take a 20% cut in the value of all of their debt. So the IMF has, is fine with that, but there are complications. Not all of the private creditors have agreed to take that money. It turns out that in Ukraine's debt, the prior slide that I showed you, right, you see the green portion of this. We know this is Russian because this came directly from the Russian state. Right? This was literally Putin and Yanukovych. We have video of them signing the agreement. But it turns out Russian banks likely own another three billion of this stuff. Because when Ukraine was in the Russian sphere of influence, Russian banks were encouraged to buy Ukrainian debt. They're holding a bunch of it. So we now have that the Western creditors have agreed to a 20%. That's about 50% of the total number of creditors. But there's still a bunch of creditors who are like, oh, we're not agreeing to any cut. We would like to get paid in full. And then, of course, the Russian state says, well, there is no way you're forcing us to take a cut. We want to get paid in full as well. And we want a bunch of your territory. So that's the situation we're in. Now, this is complicated. One of, any of you who work in international law would ask the question, I think, fairly at this point, which is that, well, the state can just not pay. Right? States refuse to pay all the time. And there's not that much you can do to a state. I mean, what more is Russia going to do to Ukraine? It's already fighting a war with it. The complication here in particular has to do with the 17.5 billion that the IMF is giving them that is crucial. Ukraine cannot survive without the money from the IMF. It needs that money. And the IMF has rules. And one of its rules is that you cannot be in default to what is called the official sector, to an official lender while it is giving you money. If you are in default to an official lender, then the IMF has to stop giving you the money. And Russia says, we are official. We are a big, important country. We are as official as it gets. And we have a big, big stake at the IMF. And so Ukraine has to somehow get it so that if it does not pay Russia, for which it does not have the money to, if it does not pay Russia, it has to be able to make the argument at the IMF and at the Paris Club that it is not defaulting on Russia. Right? So it has, to, it has to have something where it does not have to pay and is not in default. So from a legal point of view, right, that question is fairly clear. I don't want to pay you, and yet I don't want to be in default. So this is just another more vivid illustration of how big the problem is and how soon it's hitting us. This is where we are. This is December 2015. This is the size of the Russian claim. It's all coming due. Now. The problem for me was, when I was asked to think about this question, and was asked to think about it and come and present a paper in Kiev and talk to the legislators, who now after watching this video, I'm kind of glad I didn't go to visit. Uh, but the question I was asked to think about was, you know, how do you use the contract terms, the fine print, to you know, reduce your claim? Is there anything there? But I always dealt with, 
contract claims vis-a-vis -vis private creditors, people who don't have guns, who can't do stuff to you. This was a, this, in this case, we had Russia, we had a state. And that's normally the kinds of thing that folks who do international law do, the state versus state conflicts. Not people who do private law, not people who study bond contracts. In fact, state versus state lending usually has very little in the way of fine print. Often they don't even have contracts, just sort of a memorandum of understanding. So the typical techniques were not going to work. And they were not going to work not only because, we thought at least, that there weren't the typical <coughs> debt contracts, but also because when Russia lent to Ukraine, they bought the entire debt stock of those particular bond issues. So the usual way in, say, a domestic bankruptcy type setting or a reorganization setting is you try to persuade some large percentage of the creditors to agree with you to the debt restructuring, and then they force it on everybody else. And this is the typical cram down. If you get 75% of them, sometimes all you need is 50%, you do a cram down. But Russia owed 100% of those particular debt claims. And so, right. But there was something else that was weird about this. And this, this had never, we've never seen this before. And I study debt contracts from the 1820s. I spend a lot of time collecting data. From the 1820s, I've never seen this before. Where a country lends to another country, and Russia did its lending to Ukraine, in the form of a private bond. So it used documentation that is used by private actors. Even though it was just a sole lender, it kept the option for itself that it could sell it as a tradable claim. So it did it as a bond. And the other thing that they did that I've never seen before was that they lent under English law and submitted to jurisdiction in London. The state of Russia. So the claim was in an English court, was going to be in an English court, under English law. And the question then was, can we do something there? Now, the obvious question, giving my utter lack of knowledge of this, was, had to do with Crimea. Yeah, Russia says we owe them three billion in 2015. But they just came and took a bunch of our stuff. Right? They took Crimea. So ordinarily, if I owe you a bunch of money and you came and took my stuff, I'd say, well, I don't have to pay you until you pay me for my stuff. Seems fairly simple. They took a significant portion of my property. And now they're trying to take another, portion, another set of it, about 30% of the rest of it. So that was rather simplistic in terms of thinking about this. Right? And this is where we started thinking about the question of sovereign control. And please um, don't hesitate to ask me questions, because at this point, I've set up the problem in terms of what got us thinking about the question. Yeah? Beg your pardon? I, I, OK, so here I'm just guessing, because Mr. Putin has not told me what, why he did what he did. But if you look at the documentation, they have to make disclosures in the documentation about what's going on at the time when the lending happened. And they do due diligence. Because this was done as a private bond, it had the kind of due diligence that is normal for private bonds. So they had to disclose the economic and political situation at the time of the bond issuance. So at the time the bond was issued, it was very recent. This is a very short-term bond. The conflict had, potential conflict was already clear. And I think, my guess is the thinking was that if things go south, the Russians wanted the option to sell it on the secondary market. And to sell it on the secondary market, for you to buy this bond, you would not have wanted to buy a bond where Ukraine owes you money under Ukrainian law. Whereas if you had a bond that you wouldn't have known the Russians were selling it to you, you had a bond that you would just get from your broker that was under English law, 
you as an individual like me, we have a better s chance of collecting. That's my guess. It was the tradeability of it. Yes, please. You would think that. You would think they would have used the international sanctions. The, the place this would have come up was with the, you know, Russia saying that if you don't pay us and we're official, the IMF cannot give you money. That, that's where it should have come up, which is the IMF should have said, you know, you as a state are behaving so badly, we're not going to stop the money going to Ukraine because you're behaving badly. And after all, we are imposing economic sanctions on you for your bad behavior. That, to me, logically, that's what would have happened. That is not happening, and I do not know why. Um, I mean, the Ukrainians are not pushing that argument. I suspect part of it is because they're still getting gas from the Russians. They don't want to turn off the gas. Um, they're still, in theory, not a full-out war. I mean, the Russians are still saying, we're not fighting with you. It's just a separatist independence movement. So, I mean, I'm guessing that, that that's part of the politics as to where it's going on. But for some bizarre reason, the whole sanctions thing has been completely separate from this. Yeah. Can you say that Russia owes Ukraine two billion for Crimea? Or uh, no. I, I'm, so, cry, uh, Ukraine owes Russia three billion, yes. potentially six billion. Russia has arguably taken some stuff that was Ukrainian, right, Crimea. Russia is going to court, going to court in England to say, you have to pay us or we're going to seize your assets. So Ukraine doesn't have to say, this is the cost of Crimea. Ukraine just has to say, you know, before we pay you that and before you seize our assets in London, Maybe we should figure out how much you owe us for having taken a bunch of our stuff against our will. Now, you don't have to put on a price on it. All we know is it's going to be worth a lot more than $6 billion. And so, from the lawyer's point of view, it just means I don't have to pay and I'm not in default. So, uh, so tell me, there's a treaty that, that allows Russia to take I Crimea? I don't know. I, I mean, I, it's sort of, I, I'm, I'm not aware of this treaty. I don't think the Ukrainians are aware of the treaty. No, but it sounds kind of cool. No, I thought there was some kind of an agreement or something between Ukraine and There is no treaty that allows you to do that. But you're, you're, you're getting to what, we're, what I'm going to talk about next. This is, this is the complicated um, part of this. So, right. This becomes a question. So if we were talking about private parties and you had a claim, you just took their property, they don't have to pay you. Or at least, more important, they have a counterclaim against you. Without ever acknowledging you have a right to take it, you've certainly caused a lot of damages that causes them not to have to pay you. But as a matter of international law, it's actually notions of property are much more complicated. And now you have, if you go back and you look at how the argument took place, what was being claimed on both sides, you had the Ukrainians and the US and most Western governments saying, you're just not allowed to take stuff. That is a violation of international law. You can't take stuff. It is, the proper, it is our property. And traditionally, international law, at least until about 1920, you had the rich states, usually the Western powers, that felt no compunction about when they sold territory with the people on it. Sometimes, as with Diego Garcia, which is close to where I live, you know, they sell the territory, the U.S. sells the territory or leases the territory, some other great power, in that case, Great Britain, 
and then he tells the people, we don't really need you there, we're moving you off somewhere else. And that was done and that was fine. It was accepted. 1920, after World War I, this was done on a mass scale in the Middle East. So your territory, you can sell it and the people. Now, I think that even though there are international lawyers, law professors who will say that is still international law, I think it would not be OK right now to sell a chunk of your territory. If you sit in the US, you might be annoyed by um, some of the things that people in certain states do, for example, on matters like gay marriage. But you can't sell them, whether you like it or not. But on the other hand, in international law, you have these more modern doctrines of things like self-determination. So on the one hand, you have the government of Ukraine and the Western powers saying, you took our stuff. And that's a violation of international law. But on the other hand, the Russian claim is that first, we didn't take it. They came to us. And second, they have a right to self-determination. To self and that the things that happened after the fall of Yanukovych, such as the removal of Russia, Russian as a national language, were indicators to the population of Crimea, that is largely of Russian ethnic descent, that things were going to be bad for them. And so, as a matter of self-determination, they decided to vote to no longer be part of the Ukraine. So those are the two positions that were being taken. The Russians claiming this is just self-determination, and the Western governments claiming, no, there's just no right at all here. This is not self-determination. Now, this is rather extreme because, as best as we could figure out in terms of the law of self-determination, to the extent there is a law of self-determination, and it's very much in its inception, or to the extent you look at the law that is around what it constitutes to be a failed state, it's very extreme. It's very extreme in that Essentially, you have to have the equivalent of genocide going on before you get to go, you get to exit. So what Joseph and I, as we tried to work through this, we kept struggling this attempt in the international law discourse to place the question of what should happen with Crimea either in this box where the country you're a part of has complete discretion on what they do with you. Or in this box, where you can go wherever you want, just didn't seem to make sense. There seemed to be a large gap in between. A large gap in between in terms of, and in particular oversimplifying, the kind of situation where a region is being disadvantaged potentially discriminated against, its people are being discriminated against. And again, I am not saying, my Ukrainian students when I talk to them about this will immediately get outraged and say, no, 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 we, didn't dis we weren't discriminating against anybody there. Um, that's not the claim. The claim, uh, claim as a theoretical matter is if you have a region where there's discrimination but it's not getting, not as bad as the level of genocide, what are their options in terms of exit? And if you think that Crimea fit, fit within that category, don't think there's any evidence that there was genocide going on. But I think it's really hard to make the argument that they're the property of Ukraine. And that there wasn't widespread sentiment there to not any longer be part of Ukraine. Not clear they wanted to be part of Russia either. Um, but what happens in that situation? Right? And much of the paper is about tackling that. But this is, we have the problem, and then we got to this position in terms of saying, 
there's a gap in the law. And our bottom line at this point was to say, when you have a gap in the law of this kind, a region, so the region that I think about the most, or the re two regions that I think about the most because of where I come from, are Kashmir and Jaffna. Regions where there is the potential to thrive if you had a different government. If you did not have this government that was intent on, at least you, the majority of your population, thinks on oppressing you. If you have a region like that, we're just getting screwed by the government repeatedly over a long period of time, you should be able to have a different kind of government. And not just a local government, since you're getting screwed repeatedly there, but a different kind of sovereign. So hence, our paper is about that idea. That in this category, in between, we think there should be an option to go. And that gets us back to the question of Crimea. Now, it's a long-winded way of saying that we think in the Ukrainian debt context, Crimea should be a source of a defense for Ukraine to having to pay the Russian claim. Okay. All right. um, I'll stop there and I'll take questions. Yeah. Can I just get you to clarify your previous point? Are you saying that the right to self-determination under the modern conception of international law does not include uh, a right to secede simply because the people overwhelmingly want to? Yeah. Yeah, that and I just raised that because we, here in, in Canada we have a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada which takes that question within the context of our constitution, uh -huh. uh, but also interprets international law. Yeah. So how do you read that case? Oh yeah, I see this. I think our that, that uh, Supreme Court of Canada's decision is the decision that is the most sympathetic to us. And when we talk to international lawyers, they are the, they are the first ones to have said that it's not just remedial secession. And they say in that decision, that is very beloved to me, they say, we know there's not that much support here, but we think this is the decent thing to do. Um, and it, so it, it is, I get beaten up all the time elsewhere to say, How, you know, come on, that's just one decision, right? It's one decision by one crazy country. That's just way too liberal. Right? It's, not just, it's not just in that decision, right? It's that one sentence in that decision um, that is key. But it's also the 2001 convention here on failed states that, that Canada hosts the conference. Um, uh, Patrick Macklin at UT has written about this. That, has, that supports that Canadian Supreme Court decision. And um, we did research on... I, I like that decision a lot. So we did re empirical research on uh, the extent to which the ICJ and other international tribunals cite national decisions on international law. They almost never cite national decisions on international law, except for that, that one Canadian decision. <coughs> so, but yeah, it's an out, I think of it as an out, outlier. Yeah. in reading that decision to distinguish uh, between when the Supreme Court uh, purports to interpret the state of international law as opposed to the state of Canadian law, right? Fine. Yeah. So I, think, I, I don't think the Supreme Court went as far as saying that every people who feel discriminated or who are in you're fact right. discriminated you're right. You're right. You're right. can, yeah. you know, I would love that. <laughs> yes, I'm no, I, yes, you are I, right. I, so love, I love that. That's my position. I don't think that's yet the, yeah. the, and, the state but, of international law or even what the Supreme Court says. Yeah. You are exactly right. So our argument, I mean, it wouldn't do me any good to say the Supreme Court of Canada said this. It's not precedential in any way. And it was certainly what English court is not going to be bound to accept that um, or even cite to it. But I think as a logical matter, it just cannot be, it just cannot be that in the modern world, the only time a people can leave is if you're killing them. Just as a logical matter, if you're killing them, it's kind of hard to leave. 
I think if you oppress them considerably so that they cannot thrive in a Amartya Sen kind of way, at some point they should be able to go. You have 50 years of torturing and disadvantaging them, they should be able to go. And I think modern international law should allow that. I think also that it is fairly clear you cannot sell territory with people anymore. That, that just cannot be the state of international law today. Yeah. So I was wondering how you would contextualize this argument within your previous work on OES debt and if you see this as sort of an extension of that work. Because it seems like there was a lot of buzz around this idea amongst the scholars at the time, yourself, Jeff King, et cetera. But then it, that seems to have trailed off a bit. Yeah, so that also had a lot, that also came out of Canada, right? Like much of that work came, um, I did not, I, I had, back when I was working, so the notion of odious debt, um, for those of you who don't know, and I assume you wouldn't know, came up in the context of Iraq. Uh, Iraq had over a hundred billion uh, US dollar worth of debt to private creditors that had incur been incurred by Saddam's government, mostly to buy arms, arms that were in large part used to oppress the people. And then when Saddam is overthrown, the new government gets all these claims from creditors because they were too scared to sue Saddam. So they sue the new government and they say, you owe us the money um, because you are just the same state of Iraq. And so the question then was, do you have to pay the, the debts of a prior oppressive state? And is the notion of the state so strong that we do not have it in us to re realize that this different, completely different regime, one that is democratic and one that is non-democratic, um, that they're really different, uh, they're, they're different uh, borrowers. And so you're exactly right. I mean, we don't do much with that because that, that was not theoretically grounded in the same questions, but I think deep down, it really is about the question of what do we understand the state to be? And the traditional understanding of the state was really property and a government that can control the property, right? That's the Westphalian understanding is really you have the ability to control your people. And I think our modern understanding has to be that the notion of the state is tied in with democracy and the people in it. The state is the people and it's no longer can you control your people. Um, but that, that you're pushing me way, way to the other end, so, but yeah, that's where it would go. Yes? I'm just curious as to why any government would agree to a system that would allow people to leave based on certain given conditions, because, I don't know, I, I mean, it's just a general idea. Governments tend to be control freaks. They want to, they want to have control of everything. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to give people the option to do things outside of their control. So, I'm just curious, what, what do you think would be the incentive for for countries to sign on to, to a system that would allow this kind of movement or changing of borders? Okay, I don't like that question. <laughs> the answer is they wouldn't. Right? So if you say, let's have an international treaty where if a region votes to secede, they get to secede. There's nobody going to sign that. Right? And so the, 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 law, the law on self-determination, I mean, it is just astounding to me. Maybe it's just because of the part of the world that I come from. You know, we were a colony for a long time, and I have refugees on both sides of my family. Uh, the law of self-determination initially in the 1920s was for European countries after World War I. European countries, not, and it was explicitly not for colonies. So the idea was self-determination is the right of the state to determine its own fate and not to be interfered with by other states. So Great Britain got to keep its colonies. Self-determination meant th that the little people in India could, did not get to leave them. And then self-determination moves to just being about colonies. So after World War II, and reluctantly, very reluctantly, starting in the 60s, self-determination becomes about the colonies. So they had this, this incredible, I don't understand the logic of it, but clearly logic did not play a role here, the, was that if you're divided by a body of salt water, then you get to leave. I'm not sure how the connection with salt, but it was that the colonies could leave. So yes, we have the, the, the notion of self-determination, but only if you were oppressed so badly as a colony. Right. Now, self-determination in the modern world is beginning to be used in part because it's been convenient for 
countries like Russia and the US to invoke it in cases like Kosovo and Crimea, invoke it to their own advantage to be about people get to actually decide when you're being bad to them. So if as a historical matter you were to ask me, is this what self-determination was about? So let's say you were like a Antonin Scalia type of originalist about the original meaning. It's not. No, self-determination was about the great powers doing what great powers do. Right? That's always what law is about. I just want to use it in a different way, which I think that's the way self-determination should be used in, in, a, in a modern society. So, yes, but that, that's the very, I mean, people often say, well, why don't we just have a treaty? I'm like, come on. Yeah, treaty. We'll get no signatories to that. Any other questions? Come on. I can put on the video again, the fisticuffs, you want to ask me about that, tell you who the people are there. So just to avoid uh, seeing the video again, um, I guess uh, it's a great project, it's a great incitement to ask what's the relationship between the, market, the legal regimes you know extremely well, which are the private um, debt markets and the public system and how they interact. And I think it's, it's a great thought experiment, therefore. It's so tons of people here work on transnational law, the crossover between yes. public and I mean, private. It's actually, I mean, and this is one of the example. scary things about coming. I've d d the only people who are interested in hearing about this typically are people at Canadian law schools. I will, I'll give you a sense of what my colleagues thought about this. Not that you have to like it. I'm not saying this, but you're the only ones who actually want to hear about it. Um, So, uh, but, but yes. Uh, so I'm not going to say, uh, let me check, any of those things. Uh, but I'm going to say this instead, just in the, in the spirit of trying to explore what it is that you are trying to say about that, that interface between public and private. Um, it seems in the last part of the paper that what you're trying to do is introduce some of the elements of trade-off, set-off, um, uh, conflict resolution, uh, that you see used in private debt markets mm -hmm. in uh, much more high stakes, in some sense, political conflicts yes. about self-determination and, and leading to possible military conflict and all the rest. And I guess I would, er, I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about that. Um, because in some sense, what, you're, what you seem to be saying is there are these other spaces in which you could change the incentives in all kinds of directions away from either or solutions that you say is how public international, I, I think that's an issue for public international mm -hmm. lawyers, but that's fair. But, but you say that seems to be what the approach to sovereignty is in the public system. And so a little bit more to, to take advantage of that, your, your experience and your expertise and thinking creatively about how to resolve private debt issues, often involving sovereign and public interests, mm -hmm. is, is a little bit the story something like, well, if somehow in a private debt dispute, um, you could add in the possibility of a set-off claim, even when the debtor said, I'm not gonna make a set-off claim, when there's some kind of background problematic behavior that's at least contested, and that that is gonna be potentially taken into account in the private realm. And then in the shadow of that, you're creating a different kind of terrain in which public action, whether it's inside a country or between countries, occurs. And it's, it's a little bit to say, in the private realm, in the private market, there's, there are more mm -hmm. available kinds of remedies, yeah. Yeah. Uh, both at law and in the shadow of law, than the public system recognizes right now. So if you could just say a little bit more, because I think you're, you say very much in the latter part of the paper, that's kind of a, a little bit the tone. Yeah, and so, so the, this, curious about that. so I work with states. I, the, all of my work is with states, but it's with states acting in a completely different realm. It's with states acting in the private realm with markets. And I find, so I think most of you, let's say, if, if I told you here, the, our proposal is that, you know, if you treat people so badly that um, you create a huge refugee crisis, this is one of our, the uh, related papers that we're working on, you create a huge refugee crisis, we're going to impose internationally a debt claim against you. Right? You're imposing costs on everybody else. I think many of you, my colleagues, would say that's just so stupid because nobody would ever pay. Nobody would ever pay those debt claims. 
and it turns out that countries that behave badly, and this goes back to Aaron when you asked about the odious debt. One of the things we realized, South Africa, the South African government paid the debts of the apartheid regime. Bad governments and good governments, bad governments are more likely to pay. Why do they pay? Because they actually are not self-sufficient. They're not self-sufficient and they need the international financial system. And so what, what I think, so you pointed this, this out very nicely and it, we don't make it explicit, but it's seeing how states behave in the private realm when they're private actors and how they're actually incredibly disciplined even when they're misbehaving states. Whereas at the same time in the public realm, they behave very inappropriately. And so it's to try and leverage some of that into the public realm. Now the question I think that you were being polite, but although you alluded to, which is that if I push more of that behavior in the private realm towards the public realm where they behave badly, will they just behave badly in this new realm that I've created. And I don't know, will it cause more conflict? I mean, we tried to make the argument uh, that no, you know, that, that, that in, a, in, in the current global system, especially the global financial system, bad, my sense is, you know, you have states like the Congo um, where, you know, it's just, a, in some ways you might think it's just an incredibly dysfunctional state but they're so incredibly disciplined about making their debt payments. They're so incredibly disciplined about their, uh, about their transactions with their uh, counterparties that if we could translate that discipline from the private markets into the, the public sphere, maybe they would, they would do better governance. So, um, but it's, it's kind of a wild ass claim. So, but, but you've gotten it. I mean, we don't actually make it that explicit, but that, that, is, that is at the core. I don't think it was the core insight. I mean, we started with this Ukraine, Russia thing, but I think it's sort of, I'm biased. I think private markets get people to behave well and states. obvious practical effect. I just give you three examples of what I would call partial markets in sovereignty. In the Crimean situation, Russia promised to substantially increase pensions. Right. Which is a very important part of that electorate. In the current uh, trade agreements, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I mean, basically what's, what's being mark in the market there is sovereignty among the various participants, including things like rights for private companies to sue uh, uh, governments for government actions, um, and that's been carrying on, you know, for for some time. I think the IMF negotiations are also always involve uh, a, a temporary surrender of sovereignty in exchange mm -hmm. for the debt. Yeah. Okay. So I would encourage you to pursue what you're doing. I think it's great. So, so this is, I mean, you're you're taking, you guys are both taking it. So the people who work work in international agreements you realize we're already contracting out large chunks of sovereignty and you are, you are contracting out portions of your sovereignty all the time. And so this is, in that sense, this is just an like extension of that. In some ways, maybe not even a radical extension of that because quietly we're doing a lot more of this already. And, you know, I, I keep thinking about Kashmir because I went to Kashmir. Has anybody been to Kashmir? No, there's a reason why you haven't, um, because it's a war zone. But there was a time when it was one of the most beautiful spots in the world, one of the most peaceful spots in the world. It, and it just sort of, I remember going there as a child and thinking this is just paradise. And it's been ruined by the interests of two countries that couldn't care less about the people there. And it seems wrong if they're worried about um, their borders and they're worried about uh, you know, tensions and nuclear weapons you know, give Kashmir to the Swiss who will run it better and not as a colony and have a contract with them to say that they'll never have a defense force. Right? So you protect your domestic, you know, warring interests, but you allow the people there to, to have an education, to have some basic health and not have to, you know, get reduced to terrorism. That, they just seem so fun. And uh, my mom is Tamil, so, you know, and a large chunk of our family is from Jaffna, and it, it's just, 
how is it possible that the rest of the world thinks it's OK? Um, um, I'm pretty interested in uh, your response to uh, Rob Wei's question uh, and, and the question you know, that he raised. Uh, uh, I, I think that for me, uh, sort of the question that that begs is, why, in terms of your response, why is it that in that private realm, as you put it, that states, as you put it, are more disciplined? And I, I don't know, I could, I haven't researched it deeply, but, um, it, but it seems to me that if we answer that question, might we like what we see? So I'll give you my simple answer. <laughs> right. I don't, because this it's is a very, a great thing. very, right. very what? difficult yeah. question. I think that the worse you are as a state, mm. the harder it is for you to be self-sufficient. You, you know, your lifeblood is taxes. If you're a well-functioning state, you're a well-functioning state, you can collect taxes. You are less dependent on the rest of the world. You, you're actually thriving on your own. You produce stuff that the rest of the world excludes you. You're OK. The less you are functioning, the more you're exploiting your natural resources, the, the more you need outside markets. So I think that is the reason that bad governments need outside money and outside support much more, especially when they are getting their funding from outside support to exploit the people within their country. So that, that's just, so I worked closely on the question of um, arms back when I was working on the Iraqi debt. Much of, many of the arms that poorer countries buy, the weapons, they don't work. Why do you think they don't work? Anybody? <coughs> They're, they are being sold old stock. But they just, like, the plane just doesn't fly. Because they don't sell them the, all of the parts. They sell them all. It's true, but why would you buy, you know, if you're Saddam and you like to fight, then why would you buy a plane that doesn't have the parts? I think it's something like the, you mentioned the, 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 the less efficient or le uh, uh, le uh, less uh, effective the state for bringing more support from the outside. So it's almost like the, the, the international support, like, Uh, you're getting too complicated for me. The reason is they never in, uh, sorry. I was going to guess that they can buy the parts, but the parts are by the people who can maintain the equipment. Uh, so do, do, do too well meeting. It's because they, they, like, arms are the things you want to buy because if you're buying rice, for example, you're buying food stuff, there's a market price. There's a market price and you have to deliver the food stuff. With arms, you never have to actually deliver it to anybody, and you can buy the non-working plane and pay the full price and just put the rest in your bank account. That's, I mean, it's, you need the, the external market in some ways. The external financing is how you get, because you've ruined your own country. Your own country is not, and it's hard to steal from tax revenues. It is a lot easier to steal from money that's coming from outside. So uh, this is how you see which countries raise a lot of debt. That three billion, the Yanukovych three billion, in Ukraine, they claim they, not seen, they haven't seen one dollar of it. That, that money never even came into the treasury. But yet they owe, are owed a debt. They owe, owe that debt. And so, can, I come, can I come back? Yeah, please. Because but you've given, that, that's you're, the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> No, your argument is intriguing, right? But that's I'm not what, sure if it's why, right. That's it's why I'm interested yeah. in it. Um, but however, thinking you know, as a lawyer that I am, I'm just thinking of the, you know, what is the uh, flip side. So one could read your argument as arguing that a country is needy because it's poorly governed. But is that is that necessarily empirically the case? Uh, it could just be because it's plundered by the very international financial system that is imposing that discipline. Yes. The discipline that you yes. talk about. Okay, about so, you're, okay. so yeah. I, I'm, I'm with sorry. you on this. One, one more point as yeah. well. Uh, the second point is that a lot of this debt is actually not paid by the bad government. So it ends up being paid by a good government. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a lot of debt, yes. right? So, yes, yes. So the yes. incentive structure is out of whack. Yes. In, that, so, in that context, so yeah. two, two, just two points. Yeah, but you're writing the paper that I can't, <laughs> I can't write because, yeah. but the, because the question is, we only focus on, we pretend that the problem is all the local government. 
That, empirically, that's not true. So, for example, if I make the claim, Syria, the Syrian government is causing the refugee problem. But, well, yeah, in part, you know, if you gas your people, that causes refugees or you kill them. But it's also helping a little bit that they're getting a bunch of arms from Russia. It's also helping a little bit that, you know, the Western governments are bombing. So you extend this to what is causing the problem. Yeah, there are a lot more actors who are complicit. That doesn't bother me. It's a little too much for me to analyze. I mean, but also I didn't see the extension that you saw until very late in the, I mean, you saw it within, you know, 10 minutes. We've been working on this for a couple of years. And I think we really only began to see this uh, very recently. And the refugee crisis is really what got, got it to us because there's just so many actors who are causing these problems and none of them wants to pay the price for it. So, uh, but you're, 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 you're exactly right. I mean, you're just, it, you're, you're thinking of it like a mass tort as opposed to just one, I oversimplified, one actor and that everything can be solved if you just get rid of the bad government. Life is more complicated. But I think if we just get to step one, get rid of the bad government, we could make some progress and then we could get to the others. Do you have a question here? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, on. sorry. Um, thanks, Trevor Farrow from here at Osgood. Um, I, I, I missed a big chunk of this talk, so I may. Yeah, all the answers were there. I, but I was going to yeah. say, so you're going to tell me why this question is so <laughs> irrelevant. But I'm reflecting on your colleagues' comments, and you know, maybe this is a nutty idea that is totally irrelevant and is going to kill your academic career. Or, well, I mean, they said that to my colleague. He's uh, young and promising. OK, so uh, they you know, think I have had no career, so it doesn't association. matter. Um, <laughs> But it does, I mean, you must have thought about this in the context, and again, going back to the point about why states wouldn't sign on to a treaty like this, it does seem to speak to the kind of, it's, it's either radical, but it, maybe it's not so radical in the sense that this is how international law is moving. These are, uh, we see a, a number yeah. of different moments of this in public, sort of quasi-public and private international law. What are, Aren't you driving, deri deriving some support from those other conversations? And if so, are they propping you up, or is this something totally different? I think I am. So uh, for example, I, uh, thanks to Poonam, I was talking to Karen Knopp at UT and um, Patrick uh, Macklem. And I, I read their papers to say th they just give me support. I see, I, I see exactly the way you said it. I see international law moving from a notion of self-determination that was all about the Western powers and all about maintaining your colonies to a conception where it's all about the colonies getting free to a conception where it's about the peoples getting free. I, I think that is a natural progression and a natural pr progression that speaks well of it. And in one sense, I'm just trying to take advantage of it. But I. Maybe it's the use of, uh, maybe it's my belief in private markets that is, people find so offensive. Uh, um, but but uh, the way of not, I mean, people have been very, very resist, resistant. I mean, I have, you know, the comments I've gotten from the sort of leading international law scholars, I, I was stunned. They, they say states have a right to sell territory with the people on it. And that is clear in international law. And I think, uh, how can you say that? That just cannot be. I cannot imagine any court anywhere thinking that was okay. Um, but you know, it's it's old, and I don't. I think international law is constantly evolving. But there is also uh, in international law this very strong notion of history, and um, and then of course the First Nations conversations are overlaying and underlaying this stuff. Yeah, I mean, Canada is just so out of whack with uh, the rest of the world on this. I mean, that Canadian Supreme Court decision, I mean, people were so pissed about the extra language in it. They didn't need to say any of that, right? It was just about Quebec. And one of the things about governments that work well, so, you know, Great Britain might have been the evil power at one time, but when it comes to Scotland, they don't have to make any claims of international law. They say, you know, if you want to vote to secede, you get to vote to secede. I think in a well-functioning democracy, that's what happened. You don't need international law. We're talking about the places where they're not going to let you go. And, you know. Hi, uh, thanks also for the, for the paper. Um, so I just had a question is to follow up a bit on the one slide had potential costs was the threat of colonialism. Um, and some of this you know, sounds very similar to the treaties that you mentioned earlier on uh, up to the 1920s and um, 
transfers of sovereignty either between colonizers or between colonizers and indigenous peoples seen as sovereign at least for the purpose of the transfer um, of land and people and territory but you know how would how would this sort of address I guess some of those issues that you know as far as I know have not been resolved necessarily to anyone's satisfaction in in some of these settler colonial settings um, wow. and then also you know if democracy and and the will of the peoples is the shift from you know the state's complete control to uh, to decolonization to now let's just focus on the people when you have situations where there's you know who are the people um, yeah uh, you know democracy or voting democracy or any kind of you know majoritarian democracy doesn't seem to so like so democracy seems a problem colonialism seems to still be there if you could speak more to that so you're um, again this is this is a this is a tension point for us which is if we are advancing implicitly I think you have to tell me Robert because you are able to see my paper better than I can um, a, no, uh, a notion that is less historically driven. So our notion of the people is really the people who are on the land, who are there now. It is, it is a, we are not giving, and, and we're talking about what you do with the current generation and what the market value is for the current generation. We're not doing anything with, the, with a different way of thinking about this that would be historical claims to the land. Right? We were there 3,000 years ago, so it's ours. And I think if you pushed me, I would say, yeah, you know, everybody was somewhere at some point in time. But that gets to the question of really, I would say, I, I am not a firm believer in sort of, you know, a right to take back your land. But I would say, you know, I am, I am much more of a believer in a right to get paid for it. Uh, but that, that gets into claims of matters of reparations. And, uh, but it's a very related question. I, I don't have an answer, but I think that uh, th we are not going down that path at all. I mean, okay. Like in the Quebec scenario, you know, there's, there's past claims, there's current claims. Um, so um, is it just the two sovereigns who are going to be in this? Yeah, sale? I think uh, so. I think of it as there's a region. The region is being. We would think the region has to be oppressed some, not genocide, but it has to be oppressed to be able to have the right to have a vote to leave. But in a well-functioning democracy, they're willing to let you leave whether, if you think you need to leave and you're oppressed enough, they let you leave. They let you at least vote to leave, right? Well yeah, well, it's all relative. It's all relative. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Like, the, I know my, my uh, hardcore nationalist Scotch friends think that the British government played fast and loose, especially with the pressure they put with the unwillingness to give them the pound um, and influence on monetary policy, and that they really didn't play, didn't, didn't play fair. But I do think that it was really a great thing for humanity, that they allowed them, they allowed them to have the vote. And they were willing to let them go. That, that was, I mean, it was really Quebec. I mean, that was the last meaningful instance like that. And, you know, you see how uh, the Spanish have not really been so um, sympathetic to the Catalonian claims. Uh, they're not, I mean, that vote would be overwhelmingly to leave. So. But you could be a cynic and say, you know, you only let them vote when they're not going to leave. Because right, whenever you allow the vote, they don't leave. But don't be so cynical. Yeah. yeah. Maybe this is just way too hypothetical, but um, so. And you think this is not? <laughs> <laughs> so within these developed countries where we have votes and populations choose not to leave, it's often because the people recognize that if they did leave, they wouldn't have all the supports of being part of that yeah. developed country. Uh, but you could imagine a situation where in a less developed country where people actually are oppressed, they might vote and actually make the decision to leave. Mm -hmm. um, but 
in most of those cases, there isn't going to be a country like Russia who actually wants that territory ah, okay. and might actually be able to take them on. So how do you see the international system so adapting So uh, again, you're pushing me toward this, this is my belief. My belief is that if you, if you have people who could be more productive, if, I think all of us can thrive, not just people in Western democracies. I think all of us have the potential to thrive. And if we are not thriving because some government is oppressing us, there is money to be made in enabling us to thrive. And so, but, but the, you are asking a question. People often say, who would want Jaffna? Right, they're so poor. I say, but you know, if you're an investor and they're so poor, that's precisely who you want. Because they have the potential to not be poor anymore. I don't want the rich, lazy people. So, but, but this is, I mean, it's an empirical question as to whether or not a market could actually work. And the, the, when you saw underdeveloped regions that there would be, people would be willing to finance them on the condition they had better governments. I mean, that is what we're saying, which is that in the corporate context, for example, you have a badly run company. It's been badly run for 50 years, but you have new management and it can actually be well run. That's the market for corporate control and that, that is a thriving market. I don't see any reason why you can't think of states like that, even though it's offensive to many people to think of that. If you are one of the people who is in the badly run country and your only other option is immigrating, I would much rather stay in my own country and not have to immigrate. I guess my question is, does that investment really pay off within the lifespan of most investors, even most corporate investors? How long does it take for a country with no in infrastructure like that, a new country, to develop and then become profitable? Well, we, you know, we see this in Eastern Europe, right? Look at East Germany. Not long. Look at Poland. I mean, it's amazing what's been happening. So I don't know, but we're, we're I, I, you know, I don't want to sound like I know empirically this is true. It is, it is more of a hope. I, I think that, you know, I think of Kashmir. That's an easy example for me because it was thriving once. So it's not like a, you take a region that never has thrived. You might say, well, they're just never going to thrive. But with Kashmir, this was really the, the, the most desired tourist destination in the world at one point in time, or one of them. And it's completely ruined. So there is value to be made there. And to the, the fact that there is value to be made can be used to help those people, that strikes me as a good thing, or at least one we should think about. Yes. vicious cycle in this case. Like, for example, you mentioned that the, the less effective or efficient the state work or less democ democracy or whatever, the more foreign uh, support needed, like IMF. But every time the IMF and other kind of foreign support, there's always string and, uh, attached to it. There's a conditional to mm -hmm. there. So the more this uh, needed to be supported, the more conditional being attached and the more, uh, and the like kind of various interest into this uh, this region. So do you think that things can be getting like a vicious cycle, like things yeah. get so worse if you, and worse? If you were Greek, and I worked a lot, I spent mm -hmm. a lot of my time working with the Greeks, they would say, look, foreign control, it doesn't work so well. Yeah. It's nice in theory, but look what they've done in Greece with foreign control, right? Basically, as, as you had said, Greece has given up large portions of its sovereignty yeah. over the past few years as a result of not being able to pay its creditor claims. And almost all of the decisions that that foreign control has made with respect to the Greek economy, we have seen in five years have been just utter disaster. Yeah. So I got to concede that to you. I just think, I think that it, that was just badly done. It could have been done better. I think um, that the kind of foreign control that was exercised with Greece via the debt claims um, was just not done very rationally. But, but the difference between the Greece case and the Khmer's first thing is Greece economically is more uh, diversified and more potential. So that's the first, uh, first part. And the second part, the, in terms of the global atmosphere, that Greek is not as uh, uh, sensitive as the Crimea, Be because Crimea just like the in it's like the, the point of the interest from from two angles of the, mm -hmm. the planet. So so it, in Greece, uh, a Crimea case may not be the similar to the Greece case because the uh, different groups have different interests in this uh -huh. of, of region. So yeah, I, I mean. 
I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah. You're exactly right. In Crimea, um, actually, Western governments just really don't, I mean, they don't actually care that much. Yeah. And so they're not trying to micromanage the government, and they're yeah. not trying to micromanage what happens in Crimea. Whereas in Greece, they were. I mean, the, Ger the Germans and the Finns and uh, the, the French care deeply about how the Greek economy is run. Uh, and they care deeply about what their money is used for. And so they are micromanaging, and they're micromanaging badly. But I think it can be done better and should be done better. And they're going to do, do it again, right? They're starting a whole new set of micromanaging of Greece uh, that's starting this year. So we'll see. Hopefully, they'll learn their lesson from the last five years. And then this would be the example that you're talking about. It basically, Greece has contracted out its sovereignty uh, to the other European countries in, a lo in large part. If it fails, then you know my colleagues will be right. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. I thank think you. Have time for question and answer time now, and just take a moment. Um, first of all, to say I'm sure your senior colleagues are, you know, thoroughly mistaken, <laughs> as you can tell by the amount of engagement and interest you've generated. <laughs> of course. Well, absolutely, you should. <laughs> Um, and there's only one pressing question that didn't occur to anyone to ask, which is, what did you wear to that Halloween costume? What were you dressed <laughs> up as for the Halloween party in second grade? I'm desperate oh, my know. mother has the picture. I'm not telling. <laughs> <laughs> it's too embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> Well, um, so I just want to take a moment then to thank everybody for coming and um, on behalf as well of uh, Dean Sazen who had to leave um, and Osgood Hall Law School and the Genet family, I just want to thank Professor Gulati for taking the time to be with us here today no, and for giving such you. an invigorating, this was fascinating really fun. This lecture. Was, I really, so I, I, I hope you could tell I had a great time. So this was a great <laughs> question. Yeah.